Olá, boa tarde, boa noite. Ah, gostaria de agradecer a todos que estão participando aqui desse, desse evento, é, os que já estão aqui esperando há algum tempo. Um, Para mim, antes de mais nada, gostaria de agradecer muito ao convite feito pela IGS Brasil para poder participar aqui dessa, dessa transmissão, juntamente com o professor John McCartney. É, eu, Para mim é uma grande honra estar aqui, eu participei do tra, trabalho já com geossintéticos há quase 35 anos e participei da, da fundação da, da IGS Brasil, e, e eu queria dar os parabéns para a diretoria atual e para as anteriores também, pelo tra excelente trabalho que eles têm feito, e quem tem agradecido muito a associação e também a matéria de geossintéticos no Brasil. Uh, esse projeto, a IG, é, IGS em rede, é um projeto fantástico, é um projeto é, muito bom, a gente a está gente indo para a quinta palestra, as palestras anteriores todas tiveram, estão tendo visualizações até hoje no YouTube, algumas delas com mais de duas mil visualizações, é, é, e é uma coisa, é algo que a gente até há pouco tempo não conseguiria imaginar, é, mas em função dessa, dessa pandemia que tivemos e a obrigação de ficarmos em casa, isso foi uma, um, um jeito novo de, de se comunicar com, com, a, com o público, e muita gente que, que não estava tão... É, participando dos eventos da IGS, hoje tem essa oportunidade com muita facilidade. Então, uma vez mais, parabéns aí à, à diretoria da IGS Brasil por essa grande iniciativa. Gostaria também de agradecer, aí, em nome da diretoria, da, em nome da, da IGS Brasil, a, a ABMS, Associação Brasileira de Mecânica de Solos e Engenharia Geossintética, que é a grande parceira da, da IGS em várias atividades, e ne, nessa atividade em particular também, e ao canal Geotecnia Brasil, que é esse canal de YouTube que vocês estão participando, que está fazendo um trabalho fantástico também de divulgação da geotecnia é, em várias palestras em português, e essa vai ser, acho que, uma das primeiras em inglês. É, muito importante aí para a IGS Brasil são os seus patrocinadores. Então, eu gostaria de dedicar um, 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 alguns segundos aí para agradecer aí, em nome também da, da IGS Brasil, agradecer o apoio que esses, essas 20 empresas é, é, dão à IGS Brasil, isso realmente viabiliza muito todos esses, esses esforços, de, de todos os trabalhos que estão sendo feitos pela IGS Brasil. Sem, sem é, muitas demoras, muitas delongas, vou introduzir aqui o professor John McCartney, ele é professor da Universidade da Califórnia, em San Diego, é, é, também ele fez é, doutorado na Universidade do Texas, em Austin. É, tanto sua graduação quanto seu mestrado foram no Colorado, em Boulder. E, bom, ele tem vários prêmios na sua carreira, e eu vou falar um pouquinho depois em inglês a apresentação dele, eu vou, vou mencionar um pouquinho melhor. Mas essa aqui é só para dar uma, uma, uma breve palavra em, em português aí sobre o professor John McCartney. Os, as pessoas que se sentirem mais confortáveis para fazer perguntas em português, por favor, é, fiquem à vontade, se quiserem fazer comentários em português, fazer perguntas em português, não tem problema, a gente traduz depois no final para o professor John McCartney. É, então, se quiserem fazer em inglês, é até melhor, porque já não precisa nem traduzir, já, já, já só ler direto, mas se quiserem fazer em português também, não, 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 não há nenhuma restrição a isso, participem, vai ser uma excelente palestra. Eu, particularmente, estou muito curioso para assistir, porque é um tema, acho que, bastante é, novo aí, que eu, eu que já estou há 35 anos na área de geossintese, acho que vou aprender muita coisa nessa palestra. É, so, I'm going to introduce uh, John McCartney, I'm going to speak in English, because I think we might have some audience outside Brazil. Brazil. So, this is the first, the first presentation in English for this uh, series of webinars. So, Professor... Uh, John McCartney is professor in the Department of Structural Engineering at University of California, San Diego. Uh, he received his bachelor and master degree in Boulder, Colorado, University of Colorado in Boulder. His PhD degree, PhD degree uh, he received from University of Texas at Austin. Uh, his main research fields are includes uncentrated soils, Geosynthetics and thermally active geotechnical systems. Uh, 
Well, as I mentioned, in Portuguese, he received several awards, uh, but uh, the most important ones are Walter Huber Civil Engineer Research Prize in 2016, James R. Crow Medal from ASCE in 2012, DFI Young Professor Award in 2012 also, uh, NSF Faculty Early Development Career Award in 2011, and IGS uh, and IG, Young IGS Award from the International Geosyntactic Society in 2018 and 2008, respectively. <laughs> Nowadays, he is the he's the president of the International Geosynthetic Society, a North American chapter. Uh, he is also editor of two journals, uh, Geotechnical and Geovironmental Engineering and Computers and Geotechnics, and also he's in the on, on the board, editorial board of several other journals. Well, so uh, welcome, John. Uh, we are looking for your presentation. Uh, we are taking the questions uh, in, in uh, during the. Please send your uh, the questions uh, by chat. And in the end of the presentation, Professor John McCartney will answer all the questions or most of the questions. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much, Mario, for your very nice introduction. And I'd like to thank uh, IGS Brazil for the invitation to give this webinar today. Um, I, I hope that everybody who's attending is, is home safe with their families and everything is going well for you in this pandemic. It's a very trying time, but uh, there's actually opportunities to uh, reach out um, to broader audiences through webinars like this. So I'm very happy to have this uh, opportunity today. Um, so my presentation today is focused on the use of geosynthetics in geothermal heat exchange applications. Um, this is not a, um, how can I say, a, a mainstream topic um, that's very well established. Um, but I think that there's a lot of uh, opportunities from both a research perspective, as I'll show in my presentation today, but also there's a lot of opportunities from practical implement, implementation of some relatively simple tools that we can use to um, improve soils as well as to gain energy efficiency. So a, a quick overview of my presentation today. I'm gonna talk a little bit about thermal energy and what it is and why it's important and then how there's an intersection between thermal energy and geotechnical engineering. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about what geothermal heat exchangers are and how they work and how we can include these into systems that include geosynthetics. And then I'm gonna go through three different examples of projects that I worked on where I was uh, using uh, heat exchange in systems that involve geosynthetics and the geosynthetics are going to play different roles in each of them. Um, and after that, I'm going to go through some future research needs, um, focusing on those three different examples that I'm, I'm going to talk about today. Um, I think there's a lot uh, of additional research needs besides these ones I'm going to talk about, but um, they'll be focused on this. So the main motivation for looking into thermal energy um, starts from the fact that the buildings where we all live and work uh, use a lot of energy. And out of all of the different forms of ways that energy is used in the buildings, the heating and cooling systems are uh, you consume a large fraction of that uh, portion. And in San Diego, where I live, and in Brazil, and uh, many other warmer countries, cooling is one of the main things that we need to worry about. In some of the um, other regions, heating is, is also very important. But usually heat is there when you don't want it to be, and it's not there when you want it to be there. So we're gonna be using heat exchangers to move the heat uh, from one place to another, and we'll discuss how that can happen. Um, and by doing this, we can potentially use uh, freely available energy to take the place of energy that we're uh, generating via electricity or by natural gas. So we're going to try, and also by replacing these other forms of energy with natural thermal energy, we're gonna reduce carbon emissions. So um, some of the different key questions for society are how can we obtain thermal energy? So that's heat or cooling potentially. Um, how can we store thermal energy? Um, 
because sometimes when you want to heat your house, it's cold outside. So we need to store it from the hot times of the year so we can use it in the cold times of the year. Um, sometimes we don't want to have the heat and we want to get rid of it. Uh, that heat could be there just because of the outdoor atmosphere is very warm, but we could also be dealing with systems that are very hot, like landfills, as we're gonna talk about. Um, and if we get rid of this thermal energy, um, what are the, going to be the effects of this disposal process? Um, those effects could be positive. We could be using that waste energy to improve geotechnical systems, but they could also be negative by making everything uh, warmer and then the, the systems will operate less efficiently. And then we all, always want to make sure that we're uh, balancing our thermal energy throughout the year and making sure that um, our, our systems are efficient. So um, thermal energy is important and we learn about it as, as civil engineers in, in mainly thermodynamics courses and then we don't really deal with it anymore. So uh, most people that work with geosynthetics are geotechnical engineers, um, we deal with soil so how can we bring soil together with energy, uh, thermal energy? So the first is that the subsurface ground is a good insulator and it's a good heat storage medium. So we have a lot of material that's beneath our, our feet and our buildings that can be used uh, to store heat. And um, that subsurface is naturally actually storing heat that is uh, um, being applied by the sun. So it's naturally storing heat and if you, if you dig down in the earth, even in a cold time of the year, you're gonna find that the, the ground is, is still warm from the summertime. Um, and another thing is that geotechnical engineers install structures in the subsurface that can be used to transfer thermal energy. So we're installing piles in the ground, we're putting geosynthetics in, in fill type structures. Um, anytime that we put something in the ground is an opportunity for us to put heat exchangers. Um, I, I, I like to think about thermal energy in, in three different forms. Uh, so thermal energy or heat can be a resource. Uh, we need this for heating and cooling of our buildings. Um, normally in, in uh, the early days, we, we got heat by burning fossil fuels um, to either gain heat directly or through electricity. Um, but we can also try to access naturally occurring heat um, which is could be gained from the sun or from heat that's stored in the ground. Um, we could also think of thermal energy as a waste. Um, we're always rejecting heat from our buildings or from industrial processes uh, to provide cooling. So where does that heat usually go? We usually have a cooling tower and it goes back into the atmosphere and that process could gradually be heating our, our, our world up. Um, if we could use that heat, which is actually a strong form of energy uh, for other positive uses than just letting it go into the atmosphere, we may be able to be a little bit more efficient in how we do things. Um, second, it could also, thermal energy could be a waste if we're injecting heat into the ground and it's uh, transferring over onto our neighboring properties and potentially affecting systems that they're installing there. So in that sense, it could be a waste. Um, if everybody starts doing this, we, we need to be careful on how we do that. Um, third, which I think is the most important thing from a geotechnical perspective, is that we can really use thermal energy as a tool. Um, we can use it to improve saturated clays. Uh, there's a very interesting phenomenon called thermal consolidation that I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, uh, so actually heating some soft clays will actually cause them con to consolidate and become denser. Um, we can use heat to improve compacted soils, uh, which are naturally unsaturated. Um, if we heat them up, we can dry the soils, which will increase the suction and potentially make them stronger. Um, we could use heat to remediate contaminated ground. Um, geotechnical engineers also often deal with landfill processes for municipal solid waste and other types of hazardous waste. Um, this waste generates high temperatures, and if there's ways that we can modify the processes in the landfill, we could potentially have uh, an increase in energy or protect the systems that are there in the landfill. Um, and finally, in places where it gets icy, we can use our heat as a tool to uh, de-ice roadways or bridges so we don't need to use salts or other materials. So thermal energy is a, is a very broad topic. Um, I, I'm talking about it a lot now because it's not something that 
we generally think about when we're going into a, a geotechnical or geosynthetic engineering problem. Okay, so what is the main tool that we're gonna use to move heat from one place to another? Um, it's the ground source heat pump. Uh, this is basically the same sort of system that is inside of your refrigerator or inside of the air conditioning unit at your house. Um, we circulate uh, refrigerant, a special fluid within a, a closed loop system. And as we expand to contract that refrigerant material, it's going to change in temperature. And we're gonna be able to move heat from uh, one side of the loop to another side. Um, so this uh, black loop here is called the heat pump cycle, um, which is that expansion and contraction of the refrigerant. And we're going to connect things to that refrigerant loop. We're gonna have inside of our building or wherever we are, a loop where we're um, taking the heat or the cold air and pumping it into our building. And we're gonna have another loop that is gonna be connected to a set of heat exchangers that are gonna be inside of the ground. These could be inside of a pile, inside of a fill type uh, structure. Um, there's many, many opportunities for the, the ground side of the heat exchanger that we're gonna talk about. Um, heat transfer into the soils is primarily going to be due to conduction um, or due to convection of pore fluids that are in the soil. Um, it's very important to note that ground source heat pumps do not generate energy. So our goal here is never to generate thermal energy. We're always trying to move it from one place to the other. So that's why we call it heat exchange. Um, and if we have the right format for our uh, heat pump cycle, we can use it in any location. So it's not something that is limited to cold regions like uh, you know, Minnesota or Alaska. We can use it in, in warm regions too. Uh, here's just another close up of the, the heat pump cycle. I'm not gonna go into all the different thermodynamics details, but the main important thing that's important for us is this heat exchanger coil. Um, the heat pump cycle, we can operate in one direction which is going to result in a cold refrigerant being passed through this coil. And that is going to make a, a ground heat exchanger fluid uh, cool down. We could also reverse the direction of the fluid flow inside of our uh, uh, heat pump cycle. And we're gonna have hot material going into that heat exchanger coil and that heat is gonna be going into the ground. Um, here, here's a close up of what these uh, exchanger coils look like. Uh, they operate by having the refrigerant going on the outside and then uh, water or a, a glycol uh, system on the inside and then there's a lot of baffles for heat exchange and for turbulent uh, flow on the pipe. So here, here's just a picture of the uh, typical uh, temperature profiles. This is from Colorado. Um, so the average uh, air temperature there is about 10 degrees Celsius. And if you go down deep below the ground, the temperature deep in the ground is also at a stable 10 degrees Celsius. If you're near the soil surface, your temperature is gonna be fluctuating a lot. You could potentially be going below zero or up to 20 Celsius, but the deeper you go, the more stable the temperature is going to be. And there could be some upward geothermal gradients if you live close to a fault or a, a volcano but those are not really what we're focused on. We're just trying to go deep enough down in the ground where the, the ground temperature is constant. So the nice thing about that is instead of trying to move heat from your apartment or house into the hot outdoor air, we're going to be moving heat into a stable ground temperature. So that makes our system more efficient that we're always injecting heat into a constant temperature reservoir below the ground. Um, when we're operating our heat exchange system, typically the way that it works is when you're heating your building, you're going to be injecting cold fluid uh, into the ground. And that fluid is going to be somewhere between minus one to four Celsius. Um, when you're trying to cool your building off, you're going to be taking heat out of the building and putting it into the ground. So the fluid going into the system is going to be around 20 to 35 Celsius. So these are not super high temperatures or super low temperatures. Um, but we're trying to, ex for cooling mode, we're going to have hot fluid, which is about 10 to 20 degrees warmer than the ground. And then in building heating mode, we're going to be putting cold fluid that's about 10 degrees uh, colder than the ground. 
Um, okay. So these, these uh, I, I have a picture here in this drawing of a geothermal foundation and energy pile, but there's many different ways that we can configure this heat exchanger system uh, in the ground. So this is your typical building um, in wherever you want to have your mechanical room. Um, inside of there, you're gonna have a heat pump. There could be um, a buffer tank for your different fluids that are used in the system. And this is going to be going out of your house, uh, one cold fluid and one uh, uh, warm fluid line. And these could go to many different types of systems in the ground. Uh, the most common ones that are used in practice are these borehole heat exchangers. Uh, they've been using these since the 1960s. Uh, energy piles, uh, which is a topic that I've been working on a lot as well, um, have been used since the um, early 2000s, 1990s. Um, uh, but these coil heat exchangers or slinky heat exchangers or horizontal loops are three different options here at the bottom that are very well suited for use with geosynthetic systems that are usually constructed in layers where we place a backfill layer, uh, put the geosynthetic down, another backfill layer. Um, whenever we put a layer of, of soil, we could easily put uh, a, a heat exchanger loop down to help exchange heat uh, with your system. Uh, so these are just some pictures of well-established ground source heat pump systems in geotechnical engineering. Um, energy piles are, are very famous. Uh, so Brandel, um, some people in Japan, and some people in UK. Um, uh, Brandel's in Austria, and uh, also some people in Switzerland really pioneered the use of uh, energy piles. And I know that they're very popular in Brazil as well. Uh, there's several different research groups that are, are using these there. Um, in these systems, we have our regular reinforcing cage, but on the inside, we put these closed loop plastic pipes. And you put the reinforcement cage with these pipes on the ground, you uh, pour the concrete around them, and then after it's all cured, you can start to circulate fluid through these heat exchanger pipes to exchange heat with the ground, heating up the ground or cooling off the ground. Um, there's different issues you have to think about there. Um, heat transfer, you want to make sure that your heat exchange process is efficient, but also they're worried very much about thermal expansion and contraction and how that is going to affect the stresses in the energy pile as well as uh, the movement of the overlying structure. Um, and after the development of energy piles, people have started to look into things like energy diaphragm walls or energy tunnels. The thing that I'm proposing here is why don't we, as the geosynthetics community, uh, jump onto this bandwagon and make our earthen structures also energy uh, MSC walls and things like that. So that kind of segues into the first example that I'm going to talk about here. Um, ground source heat pumps and geosynthetic reinforced structures. These are usually above the groundwater table. Um, they're constructed with compacted backfill soils. Um, the, those backfill soils are typically unsaturated. Um, in most cases, most specifications require that the backfill be a well-draining uh, well draining backfill uh, with minimal fines, or the maximum of 12% uh, fines. Um, however, one proposal that I'm having in my research is that maybe if we're able to keep those backfill soils dry, we may be able to expand the range of backfill materials that we use. Uh, so we could potentially use more site um, locally available backfill soils, which could be silty, um, uh, sandy clay materials, which don't meet specifications according to most uh, standards, but if you keep them unsaturated, they're gonna be as stiff and as strong as a, a well-grading well-draining uh, granular backfill soil. Um, so the goal here um, is to use our heat exchange system that we've talked about to inject waste heat into our uh, either retaining wall, uh, this is maybe a more of a slope, or maybe even embankments. And um, in that case, we'd be getting rid of waste heat by injecting it into the ground. We're not uh, releasing it into the atmosphere. And we're also using it to dry the unsaturated soil. And as we dry the unsaturated soil, we're going to lead to higher backfill strength and stiffness. And if we operate this continuously, we potentially could always keep the system dry. There's a lot of tricks and, and things you need to be careful from an engineering design, but from 
a concept, it's, it's an interesting thing that we can look into. Of course, whenever you bring in temperature with geosynthetics, there's gonna be a lot of problems that we'll talk about in a second. Uh, creep, um, how are you going to be allowing drainage of these materials? Um, but those are opportunities for things that we can, uh, problems we can solve. Um, and the configuration I'm showing here, uh, uh, if the blue lines are the geosynthetic reinforcements, we can potentially put the heat exchangers on every other lift when we're constructing the wall. In this case, the heat would be flowing towards the, uh, the geosynthetics. And if we use a specific type of geosynthetic that acts as a drain, then the water that is flowing due to this heat transfer process could exit through the geosynthetic. So that would be the, the mode of drawing. Um, so what does it look like when you put these heat exchanger loops out on the ground? This is a typical um, trench application of a geothermal, geothermal heat exchanger. Um, this, in this case, they had to dig a big hole down beneath the ground um, to place these slinky loop systems. There's no reason that we couldn't be placing these same sort of systems in a, a field type structure up above the ground. Um, and then the heat that we're using to inject into the ground could come from waste cooling of buildings, uh, waste heat from industry, or also even solar thermal panels. I've done a lot of research where we extract heat from solar thermal panels. We can get water that's 80 or 90 Celsius and use that to heat the ground. Um, heating on saturated soils leads to a lot of complicated things, um, which is fun from a research perspective. But um, at the end of the day, I, I think it, it works. Um, when we dry the soil, it's going to lead to an increase in effective stress, um, which is going to lead to greater shear strength and stiffness, and potentially a, a change in yield stress due to suction-induced hardening. Um, there's also some negative effects that we need to think about, um, changes in water retention. Um, as the temperature changes, the properties of the fluid changes, including the surface tension and contact angle. Um, we could have changes in thermal conductivity as the soil dries. Um, soils could change in volume. Although compacted soils typically uh, don't change in volume plastically, it's more of an elastic expansion during heating. Um, we'd have things like thermal softening, uh, which is a change in the yield stress, as we'll see in a, a couple of figures later. And then also changes in the behavior of our geosynthetic reinforcement due to uh, enhanced creep. Um, just quickly, when we heat unsaturated soils, um, the thing that happens is that uh, the properties of fluids are very sensitive to the temperature. So we're going to end up forming a surface tension gradient and a vapor pressure gradient in an unsaturated soil layer. And these are gonna cause water to flow from the hot region to the cold region. And that process is very slow and it's not a fast process, but if you're applying a sustained temperature boundary condition to your system, it, it, it could be okay. Um, there's many variables that affect this process, um, including the initial conditions and then the soil properties. Um, and this is just one example from an early study that one of my students did we used uh, VEDOS to do a 1D heat transfer analysis with coupled uh, water flow. Um, he applied 60 degree temperatures at three different heights and then uh, observed the changes in temperature with time. And then also the changes in degree of saturation very close to one of the heat exchanger, uh, one of the geosynthetic layers. And he found that uh, during heating, uh, it did take some time for the, the soil to reach equilibrium, but then right at the location of the heat exchanger, you ended up seeing a very large decrease in degree of saturation. Um, th these are relatively not very large, 0.1, but this small decrease in, in degree of saturation can have a big effect on the effective stress. And the longer we wait, the greater the zone of influence is going to be. Um, and you could also change things around to like the, the lift spacing to, to alter this system after it works. But at the end of the day, we're gonna be heating the soil at some different locations and it's gonna be causing drying right at the location of the heat exchangers. And that water is gonna to have to go somewhere. So you actually see a little bit of a wet region as you go further away from the heat exchanger. Um, when you heat soils, um, when they, they're gonna cause drying, 
So the drawing is going to cause an increase in strength. It's well established that drawing uh, results in an uh, increase in suction, and that suction causes an increase in effective stress, and that causes an increase in strength. But heating is not really as well known. The effects of heating are not as well known. Uh, the main thing that usually happens there is there's a, a softening of the peak uh, behavior. So for each of these, uh, this is a saturated soil, a little bit drier and then a little bit drier. Um, it's a study from uh, Nasser Halili in Australia. They see a decrease in the peaks, peak strength, um, but at, at larger strains, the, the strength is not affected by the temperature. But at the end of the day, the effect of suction is generally greater than the effect of the temperature. Um, so going on to talk about the effect of temperature on geosynthetics, this is something that uh, we as geosynthetics engineers um, understand and actually use in our analyses. Um, the concept of the stepped isothermal method to uh, evaluate creep in an accelerated manner is, is well established. Um, so in, in this particular study by uh, Jorge Zornberg, he applied different amounts of temperature while applying the same mechanical stress and each increment in temperature caused an, a different, uh, an additional amount of strain. Um, this kind of depends on the particular geosynthetic that you're looking at and the glass transition temperature is, is an important value to consider. Uh, some materials like polypropylene, any changes in temperature could cause uh, uh, creep because you're going to be always above the glass transition temperature. Uh, but other materials like PET, you need to heat it up to a relatively high temperature before creep starts to happen. Um, and we could also look into some ways that we can maybe play around with these results to show that maybe there's going to be a decrease in the stiffness of the material with temperature. Uh, this is just from a example study that one of my students, Melissa Stewart, prepared where she was trying to analyze the effect of temperature on the, 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 the tensile stiffness. Um, but those effects of creep, you have to think that the soil in your, uh, your system is also going to be confined, confining the soil. So you're going to restrict the geometric uh, movement of your geosynthetic. Um, and there's a well-known study from McGowan that if you confine your soil, your geosynthetic in soil and apply a tensile stress to it, um, the amount of creep is gonna be much smaller than uh, in isolation uh, conditions. So all of these stepped isothermal methods where we looked at the effects of temperature on creep are always uh, in isolation conditions. By putting into the soil, maybe the combined effects of confinement and temperature could uh, potentially uh, cancel out. So we wanted to study this uh, for this particular example using a um, pull-out device. This is a, a Frankenstein device that I developed in the lab um, using some scrap materials that are laying around. So it doesn't look very fancy, uh, but it gets the job done. It incorporates a, a, a reasonably large sized um, pull-out box here, which can accommodate uh, 300 millimeter wide and 300, 300 millimeter long a geosynthetic specimen, uh, roller grips, a linear actuator for uh, constant pullout. And if we want to apply uh, constant stresses, we have a pulley system, uh, constant tensile pullout stresses. We can use a pulley system for load control testing. Um, we have a Belafram piston here on the top to apply a constant vertical stress. Um, we can measure changes in height of the specimen. And as I'm going to show in a second, we have the capability to control the temperature at the top and the bottom of the specimen. These are just some drawings, the side view and top view. Um, and from the back, we can include some different potentiometers for telltales uh, to uh, evaluate the mobilization of strains within the geosynthetic during pullout. Um, here's a, a cross-section view of the box. Um, at the top and bottom, we have heat exchangers, and this is our compacted soil within. And we can embed some different sensors into the soil that can measure both temperature as well as um, the volumetric water content. Uh, these are gonna be very, very important, as I'm gonna show in a second, to be able to understand the processes that are happening as you 
heat the edges of the box and the water flow comes towards the center. Um, and this is a, a, a geo geotextile that we used with the different telltales uh, located at different locations. Um, these are the heat exchanger plates. Um, it's not you know, perfectly covering the entire area of the specimen, but the main active area, um, we have a sleeve here in the front. So this main region of the geosynthetic is going to be affected by the heat exchangers at the top and bottom of the box. It's just an example of the placement of the uh, dielectric sensor at one of the, the lifts. Um, so just uh, some quick examples of uh, some results from a few, few tests that we performed on a PET geosynthetic. Uh, these were performed by Bernardo Ambriz, uh, one of my previous um, master students. Um, he heated the boundaries of the box up to 30 degrees, 40 degrees, and 50 degrees. Um, all of these results are right at the, uh, the geosynthetic level, so the edges of the box reached uh, 30, 40, and 50, but the center of the box uh, may not have reached that uh, large of a temperature when you reach steady state. But we heated it, um, stabilized the temperature, um, we allowed the water content to change depending on this thermally induced water flow process that was happening. Um, we could convert that change in water content to a change in effective stress. And we also measured the void ratio from the change in height. Um, during those tests, we applied 10% uh, of the maximum pullout force. So we were able to characterize the amount of creep. And we did see a little bit of additional creep with uh, elevated temperatures, but the amount of the magnitude was not significant. And with applying just 10% of the maximum pullout force, we didn't reach creep rupture. So we did see a, a couple of millimeters of movement, but we, we deemed that wasn't significant. Uh, these are the profiles of temperature. You can see that it got hotter at the boundaries than it did at the center. Um, the weird thing was when we looked at the water contents from the dielectric sensors, it looked like things were getting drier as you go beneath the geosynthetic, but some of that water was accumulating up above. But if you're right below the geosynthetic, things were pretty stable. Um, but at the end of the test, we uh, took the box apart and measured more water content values than the locations of the sensors, including right above the geosynthetic. It would have been nice to put another sensor there, but we found that right above the geosynthetic, water was pooling. So that had a very negative effect on the pullout results as I'm gonna show in a second. And one of my future research topics that I'm gonna talk about later is that if we had used, instead of a PET geosynthetic, a wicking geosynthetic, the water that was moving from the boundaries to the center of the geosynthetic could have been removed laterally uh, from the soil layer. But instead, the water moved towards the geosynthetic and it ended up just accumulating on top so right on the top of the geosynthetic, instead of drying out, it actually got wetter. Um, so these are some of the different pullout tests. Um, we did a test without any um, um, seeding creep, uh, seeding load for creep, and also two tests with uh, uh, seeding loads. Those were relatively similar. Um, but when we heated the soil up to uh, 40 and 50 degrees Celsius, the boundaries, we saw a, a large decrease in our uh, pullout capacity. So heating the soil did dry a portion of the soil, but it got another portion wet, and that led to a decrease in our pullout resistance. So this wasn't the, what we wanted to see um, in the research, but at the end of the day, we understood why things were happening the way they were. We were causing drying, but the water just did not, didn't leave our system. We ended up having a wet zone and that actually caused a, a decrease in our performance. Um, so these are things that you see sometimes when you go through research projects and uh, it, it creates more questions that you can look at in, in future projects. So I think it's, it's possible that this system could work with the right uh, soil and geosynthetic and temperature combinations. I'll, I'll show some future research needs at the end that are, that are focused on this. Um, but maybe I, I'd like to switch gears and talk about a second example. Oh, I better go quickly. Um, this is using geosynthetics and soft clays. Um, in this case, uh, we can put our heat exchangers inside of a 
a prefabricated vertical drain to create a thermal drain. And in this case, um, because water and soil have very different thermal expansion coefficients, as you increase the temperature of the soil, you actually can generate pore pressures. And as you generate those pore pressures, um, they're going to dissipate to regions where it's not hot. And when they dissipate, you're gonna have a contraction. So this is a concept called thermal consolidation. Um, so people in, in uh, Thailand and Switzerland uh, identified that this was a potential application of geosynthetics and they looked at some uh, embankments where they put these prefabricated vertical drains with temperature control. And they did a reference test um, just to measure the shear strength um, at room temperature and then also heated and cooled the soil and saw that the soil was much stronger. So this is just showing that the heating process causes your uh, soft clay to become stronger. And then they also looked at the consolidation process with room temperature conditions and also with elevated uh, temperatures. So they were able to get more consolidation by using uh, elevated temperatures within their prefabricated vertical drains. Um, so we did some centrifuge tests um, on a uh, just rigid pile. We didn't do a, a drain at this point yet, um, but I'll show some results. Uh, we heated it up, measured the temperature in the soil, the changes in pore pressure, and then we did a pull-out test to prove that this was going to work. This is our centrifuge that we have here at UCSD. Um, we first consolidated it in the centrifuge, made sure everything was stable, um, heated it up, so our pile reached a relatively high temperature. Our soil um, also increased in temperature. As you're, if you're close to the pile, you have higher temperatures than if you're farther away. And then we did a pull-out test. And due to the thermal consolidation that was happening, due to these changes in temperature, we saw an increase in pull-out capacity. <coughs> so this is a case where we're using temperature to improve our soil. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about future research on that area as well later. But the last topic was uh, using heat extraction from municipal solid waste landfills. Um, it's well known that when you put all of your waste there, there's going to be uh, biodegradation processes, which are going to lead to relatively high temperatures in the waste. And there's been many studies that show that those temperatures can actually have a negative effect on your landfill liner system, which includes geosynthetics. So we can potentially put geosynthetic heat exchangers into the landfill to protect our geosynthetics in that case. Because if we're applying high temperatures to a GCL, for example, you're going to dry it out and cause desiccation. And when uh, outflow from the waste happens, you're potentially going to cause problems. You can also use the, the heat exchangers to augment the behavior of the landfill for other purposes, like controlling the gas generation rate or the settlement rate. Um, but we, we did a, a field study here in San Diego. This is where I, I live, where I am right now at UCSD. And uh, this is a landfill out in a town called Santee. It's operated by uh, Republic Services. Um, my student, uh, Leticia Shinoko, from, uh, she's from Curitiba in Brazil. Uh, she helped me on this project. Uh, this was her PhD project. And we received funding from Geosyntec uh, consultants to do a field demonstration of this topic. Uh, this was a new landfill cell that was being built. Um, and we put some heat exchangers here. I'm gonna go a little bit quickly now. Uh, we put the heat exchangers in this horizontal configuration that I showed you before. We call this a serpentine approach. And we put some different instrumentation into the waste to measure the changes in temperature in the waste and then around the heat exchangers. And we looked at three different layers. One that is right on top of the base liner, which is important for geosynthetics, and uh, two also in the waste itself. And the goal of this project was mainly to figure out what the waste thermal properties are in situ, and then to show that it was feasible. So this is the, the, the serpentine system here on the ground. You can see the waste being placed back here. It was pretty smelly, also very hot, and you have to watch out for rolling uh, palm tree segments. Um, but we were able to get everything uh, installed. These are some different thermistor strings that we installed. Um, we uh, filled all the pipes with water so that they wouldn't be crushed under the weight of the waste. Uh, placed a small amount of uh, cover soil to protect them as well. And then this is the system af after it was constructed. It was just a big hill. You couldn't see any of the trash. Uh, we connected everything to a data acquisition system and measured the temperature for uh, about a year. We saw the waste temperatures get up to about 50. 
Um, this uh, gray line here is the air temperature. So you can see that at all locations, our waste temperature was greater than the atmospheric air temperature. Then we did a heat extraction test. And uh, this layer one here was our liner system. Uh, we inject a cold fluid, a warmer fluid comes out, and then we can convert that to a certain uh, heat transfer rate. Um, so you can see the heat transfer rates are here. Uh, layer one had a higher heat, a lower heat transfer rate, potentially due to the, the drier uh, liner system that was below half of the, the heat exchanger. We can use this information to estimate things like the thermal conductivity. But at the end of the day, we wanted to know what are the spacings that we need to use in order to, to make an efficient heat extraction system. So um, I'm just going to transition now to talk about free, future research needs in the opposite order from the different three examples I showed. Uh, this is that same uh, system that we installed in the landfill with our serpentine heat exchanger. We wanted to first match our observations in the field um, so we can see what the temperature profile is going to look like within our waste so that we can figure out how we can control the system. So maybe we want to say, let's keep our temperature at the liner always at 25 Celsius. We need to have a certain spacing because we know that maybe the temperature is going to be varying with space. But on average, if we have them at a certain spacing and we apply a certain inlet fluid temperature, we're going to have an average temperature in, in the waste. So we've done some simulations for that. Um, but these two topics here are our future research needs. Um, as I mentioned, in our uh, thermally active retaining wall systems, um, based on my research, we need to use these wicking geosynthetics in order to remove the water from the unsaturated uh, backfill material. Um, I think that there's a lot of research that can be done on these, both to understand their creep properties as well as their uh, performance in removing this uh, thermally induced water flow. Um, and then if you start to really get this to system to work, um, looking at it on a regional basis, um, these are some interesting studies from Cambridge showing the distribution of heat exchange systems in London. Um, and you can see that there are some very hot regions and cold regions in the same area. If we're able to balance out our movement of heat in these systems, potentially having embankments or some things like that, we can transfer heat from these hot sections to colder sections. Um, in our thermal drain topic, uh, we need to look into uh, all the different boundary conditions and how high should we heat the temperature, how long should we heat it. Um, we want to make sure that if we induce pore pressures in the soil that we're not going to cause thermal failure because our changes in pore pressure are equal to decreases in effective stress. Um, what is the effective depth within our soil layer? Um, and one topic I didn't talk about, but could easily be integrated with thermal drains or the thermal uh, reinforcement systems. If we're heating the ground, uh, we could be mobilizing contaminants in the ground and using our geosynthetics to remove these contaminate, contaminants from the soil. So we can integrate our thermal drains with GSHVs for remediation. So some final comments. Um, we can use thermal energy as a resource. So we can access that heat uh, using ground source heat pumps. Uh, if uh, thermal energy is a waste, then we have uh, large reserves where we can uh, store this energy so we can use it later or we can use that heat for a positive purpose in improving our, our backfill. Um, and there's also many, many opportunities for both the research and a practical side to use thermal energy as a tool. Um, and I, I think I showed some of the different areas there. Um, one interesting thing about this research, even though it's not a mainstream area, is that the, the ground source heat pump and the closed loop heat pipes are, are very well established technologies. So by putting these into the ground, we're not going to be, you know, there's no nanotechnology or anything involved. They're relatively simple tools that we can use to achieve goals that we didn't know about before. Um, but of course, when you heat materials up, there's going to be things that you didn't think about. Um, and that's where research can come in uh, to try to solve these problems. So with that, um, I'd like to thank, thank all of the students that worked on these uh, projects with me. Um, the US National Science Foundation sponsored a lot of this research. And then as I mentioned, Geosynthetic, Geosynthetic Consultants and uh, Republic Waste Services. Um, for their help on the landfill project.
Um, so with that, I, I'd like again to thank you all for attending today and I'm very happy to, to answer any questions that you may have. So close out the presentation now. Thank you, John. Excellent presentation. Uh, I, as I said in the beginning, I learned a lot. Uh, uh, to be honest, uh, I have a lot of doubts. So uh, maybe I, I will be one of the, the guys that will play some questions to you because I really like the, the subject and it's pretty new to, to me also. Um, I, I'm not sure if uh, we have a slide here to talk. Before we go to the questions, I would like to talk about the a program, IGS Brazil program, that's uh, educating the educators. Uh, I'm not sure if we have the slide here or not. If we don't have... I'm sorry to ask you the question, so that's okay. Um, um, the temperature doesn't affect the strain uh, properties of the soil, so it doesn't affect the friction angle um, of the soil. But, <laughs> so that, in effect, could change your shear, shear strength. So maybe, Flavio, you wanted to, to mention a few things about your upcoming program. Yeah, sorry, sorry, there was a technical problem here. Uh, but I'm not sure if it's prepared or not. Uh, uh, so I, I will start with the questions. I, I think you already answered the first question. Uh, uh, right, John? I, yeah. I lost. OK. Um, yes, uh, well, uh, as soon as uh, we have this slide, I think we have a slide from IGS that will talk about the educated educators. but. Uh, uh, we need to put on, on online. Uh, somebody will put this slide, and then we talk about that. Uh, I, I would like to 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 ask a question from Odivan Ferreira. Uh, he asked about cost. Uh, what about the the cost uh, uh, of the system uh, comparing to the energetic return? Uh, uh, in the how do you think that? Do you have an estimation about cost? Not not how much it costs, but if it uh, how is the payback of the system? Um, so yeah, th these uh, geothermal heat exchange systems usually, if you're using it for heating and cooling your house, it's five to seven years uh, payback period. So it does it does take some time uh, to accumulate uh, benefits over time. So it's not something that you're going to be able to pay off in one year. Um, it's also something that the installation cost is the main part of the cost. So if you're already installing a, you know, a geosynthetic reinforced system, or if you're putting piles in the ground, you're already spending a lot of money to build and install your system. And the fraction of the cost that is involved with your heat exchangers is very small. So it it's not a, a major part of the, the cost of your system. If you were just going to go there and put the heat exchanger in the ground and that's all you're going to be doing, that takes yeah five to seven years to pay off. But if you're already installing other things, by piggybacking on that, you're reducing your cost of installing the geosynthetic system and it could be a faster payoff. Uh, I have one question to you. Uh, my first question is, um, 
do you do you uh, when you uh, is it available uh, any have you done any project uh, about that or is just a research program nowadays do is there any job done uh, with this the, the three solutions that you have implemented or just research for the time being and so, if it is there is any any uh, product available in the market that we could buy or could search for um okay so the, the three projects that I presented here were all um, research still. En energy piles is very, very well established and people are, are selling this now. Um, there, there isn't like a, a geosynthetic product that you would necessarily sell at the moment, like a geosynthetic prefabricated vertical drain. Um, that would be something that would be very nice to develop. Um, but, uh, if you were just going to be putting the, the pipes down on the ground, those are, you know, readily available with most geothermal contractors. Um, there are several different companies for this plastic pipe all around the world. Plastic pipe is another geosynthetic, if you think about it. Um, and, and we know the properties of that very well. Uh, the, the landfill application, definitely there's been, I think, four major projects where it's actually been installed in a full landfill. So that's maybe the closest to full implementation. The thermal soil improvement and the, from unsaturated and saturated soils, um, there's potential, but they're still uh, on the research level. Yeah, uh, there is a question here from Charles, uh, Charles Chavez. Uh, would it be possible to justify the use of geothermal structures for temperatures above 50 degrees in industrial applications, not only in geosynthetics, but for heat exchange piles? Yeah. Um, so high temperatures, if you're just doing heat exchange to heat and cool your house, the temperatures are going to be between 5 and 35 Celsius. So they're not going to be very hot. But if you start getting... Uh, temperatures from places like um, solar thermal panels, and maybe you, you have a very hot summer and you want to store the heat in the ground, your temperatures could be very high, up to, to 90 Celsius. Um, there's been several uh, heat storage systems in uh, Denmark, Canada, where they're taking heat from solar thermal panels, installing it in the ground. And those are very cold places, but they're using it to, to heat entire communities. So it's like a district heating systems. Gotcha. So you, you could definitely encounter that high of temperatures. Uh, uh, Saj, Sajad Vazeg um, asked, uh, is there any practical application of using thermoactive geosynthetics in, in road layers, materials such as unbounded ground materials, or in railways such as ballast? Yeah. Um, so there's there's definitely a well-established use for uh, um, de-icing systems. So those are usually more located on on bridges uh, because the the salts that are placed for de-icing on bridges can have a very large uh, negative long-term maintenance cost. Um, in roadways, it's not as common to be used, um, but it, there's no reason that it, it couldn't be used. Um, it's just a matter of location and scale. Yeah, I think the question here was more ab about the uh, the unbound granular materials, like the base uh, and ballast. Okay, so without do the you see, do you see potential for that, or? Um, so those materials generally drain very quickly, um, and they're very thin. So the amount of they wouldn't really store a lot of heat and the heat may not improve the material very much. So, um, potentially, uh, it, yeah. It could well, mitigate yeah. long term against fouling or something like that. But, yeah. uh, Tiago Souza asked, uh, offshore tidal energy generation systems provide a novel approach to, uh, to harness the tidal movement of water. Could you share this theme? Uh, is there any research in this direction? Yeah. Um, so tidal energy generation theme uh, systems are definitely a 
not necessarily using thermal energy. Um, they're maybe capturing the energy from the waves, but the foundation systems for those materials, for, for those systems could be improved using this thermal consolidation concept. Um, if you potentially put these thermal drains down in the ground before you placed your, your system on the soft clay layer, you may be able to have a, a more stable system because these have a, a high rocking issues. So um, we've worked a little bit on that in, in a, a separate research project, but that was more for just the pile, pile response to cyclic loading. Great. Uh, Sergio Costa asked, uh, does temperature affect uh, soil, geomembrane soil or geomembrane GCL interface shear strength? Is it an important design parameter? Yeah, so I was, I was mentioning that earlier that the, uh, the drain properties of the soil, so the, the friction angle and like the coefficient of, consult of com the compression index are not affected by temperature, but when you heat the soil, it's going to potentially change in volume and it could dry out. So both of those things could change your shear strength. So the, the strength itself could be changing, but the properties uh, governing the, the change, governing the strength are not changing. So it's more of a, you know, you, you keep the same friction angle, but you're moving it to different points along the, the friction angle. Okay. Uh, I, I have some, uh, there are more questions here, but I also would like to ask you, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, uh, you, you explained three potential uh, applications that you are studying. Uh, the first one, uh, I think the second one is a kind of a treatment that you, you, you use uh, the, the heat exchange and then during a certain period of time, and then you improve the soft soil. But the, mm -hmm. the other two, the other two, the other two solutions are uh, like say you have to keep the warm all the time. Is it correct? My understanding. Yeah. So they're more long-term applications. Okay. Um, so yeah, you would only use the the embankment or, or retaining wall system if you had a lot of waste heat coming from one place. Like if you're in a, a apartment building that has uh, centralized air and is trying to uh, remove the heat, then you can always be you know, rejecting heat into your embankment. Um, and then the waste is always generating heat due to biodegradation, so you're always able to extract it. And if you extract it and stop, it's going to heat back up again. <coughs> OK. Uh, we had a, a, a question here from Sol Technique Consultoria e Engenharia. What's the typical energy problem in them? Could you share more information in this area? I don't know if I understand the question, but this is exactly what, what it's written here. What's the typical energy problem in, in them? I mean, dams are very large earth problems. I, I think putting the heat exchangers there may cause some problems because of you don't want to have a lot of hydraulic pathways. Um, you could potentially use it to improve the, the, founda the foundation for the dam before you place it if the, the foundation is on soft clays. Um, if you put it in the granular material, you could be injecting heat and then the flowing water could be taking the heat away. Um, yeah, I, I think there's there's potential, but yeah, I would, I would stay away from the core of the dam. Okay. Uh, Julio Zambrano asked, uh, uh, how, uh, what about the, the installation damage of these uh, heat, heat exchange devices? Are they flexible or strong enough to, to, to bear the, the installation damage? So that's, that's a nice thing about uh, the geothermal heat exchangers is that they actually are geosynthetics themselves. They're plastic pipes. Um, most of the pipes that I've used are polyethylene, uh, high density polyethylene pipes. And, um, you know, they can be stretched. They, they have pretty good um, compression resistance, especially when you fill it with water before you place the, the material on top of it. The water is incompressible. So when you try to compress it, it's not just an empty pipe. You're having a, a water filled pipe. Um, and unless you put something very sharp on top of it, uh, the 
you know, every all of the heat exchangers we placed into the landfill survived, and that was um, 30 meters of waste, so pretty relatively high stresses within in, in homogeneous material. Um, in in uh, energy piles, uh, they're in a vertical configuration and they're embedded in concrete. Um, as long as they don't get snagged on a wire or something like that, they're pretty stable. So it's a, also a durability problem that we study in, in geosynthetics and engineering. Okay. We have another question from Sajad Vazeghi. Uh, can such systems, thermoactive geosynthetics, be used in deep excavations for retaining the excavated earth for short-term purpose, for example? In yeah, excavations. Um, the, the question is about excavations. Yeah, in Europe, they're, they're using these very widely in diaphragm walls. Um, so those are cut cut type systems and the, the ones I was talking about today are more the fill type systems. Okay. Uh, except the, 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 the consolidation, then yeah. you have also to, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we maybe improve it and then. We, we have a lot, we have a lot of compliments to your presentation and one question from Thais Moraes. Uh, how are the thermal properties of compacted soils? That, uh, the, how are the thermal properties of compacted soils that, that determined uh, determined for applications in reinforced soil walls? Is there any specific field test? Field test for the thermal properties of the compacted soil. Yeah, uh, thermal properties. I, I would. I, I mainly use the KD two Pro um, thermal needle. As long as you can push the needle into the compacted soil, if there's not a lot of large aggregates, it can be used. Um, but from a field perspective, if like if you had a lot of large aggregates, the needle is very hard to, to push into it. You would almost have to take a, a sample and do a, a heat plate uh, thermal analysis. Um, it's it's possible. Oh, and then oh, sorry, if if you have your heat exchangers in the ground. You can use the heat exchangers themselves uh, to do a thermal conductivity test of the compacted soil. So you, you, you can basically apply a constant thermal boundary condition to your heat exchanger, see the system heat up or cool down, and process that to estimate the thermal conductivity. So using you can use your heat exchangers to estimate the thermal properties. OK. Uh, Sajad Vazeg asked another question. Uh, how about increasing the efficiency of these systems? Uh, can we use techniques like micro induced calcite precipitation to increase the thermal conductivity of the system? Yeah. Um, if you increase the thermal conductivity, uh, you're going to be moving the heat faster. Um, in some cases, with unsaturated soils in particular, we may want to be storing the heat, so you, you may not want to lose the heat so quickly. So ha having the high insulation behavior of the soil is a potentially good thing. Um, but if you wanted to, uh, you know, efficiently transfer heat, then yeah, having these, uh, uh, any way to improve the thermal conductivity using biological treatments would be nice. Densification. Okay, uh, John. Uh, the in your first in our first case that you present to us, uh, you you mentioned that you have said uh, uh, polyester geosynthetic. Was it a woven or a grid or uh, it was a woven. Of, as a woven? Yeah. Okay, because you said there was accumulation of water, so probably yeah. probably the yeah. I, I was hoping I didn't really do any. Uh, vapor diffusion tests, but I was hoping that the water would come from the boundaries to the geosynthetic and then the geosynthetic would have enough transmissivity that it would take the uh, the vapor out, but I, I think that the fibers were not necessarily connected enough to, to route the water out. So the water just came to the middle and, and stayed there and stayed right on top, not on the bottom. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> well, you have a lot of compliments here. Everybody is uh, enjoying very much your presentation. 
uh, I would like to take the opportunity before uh, we, we finalize to just to show one slide about the, a program that IGS Brazil is organizing. Um, yes, it's, uh, well, we have more than one slide probably. So uh, we have next, uh, uh, we have next week, we will have uh, another presentation. Uh, another, yes, it will be uh, Tiago Zanon. Uh, I will speak in Portuguese here because it's more for the Brazilian audience. Panorama do uso de geossintéticos em aterros de resíduos no Brasil. Uma palestra do, da Solve, Tiago Zanon. É, mesmo horário, é, mesmo dia, quarta-feira. Acho que tem mais alguma notícia aqui. Educando educadores. É, I will come back to English, but just speak in Portuguese now. Educando educadores é um, é um projeto é, desenvolvido pela Sociedade Internacional de Geossintéticos, E a IGS Brasil é, é, o, é um dos capítulos da IGS que mais organizou esse, esse treinamento. É basicamente treinar os professores a, a, a darem aulas sobre geossintéticos. O próximo será virtual, a, a gente já teve acho que uns quatro ou cinco em anos anteriores, o próximo será virtual e será no dia 21 de agosto a 10 de setembro. Então, por favor, acompanhem nas redes sociais e te, façam suas inscrições. É um programa totalmente gratuito. É... So, é, tem mais algum anúncio da IGS Brasil? Ou esse é o último? Acho que é só isso. Ok. So, John, uh, thank you very much for your brilliant presentation. Uh, I can talk on, on behalf of IGS Brazil. It was a, a very, very nice presentation. It was very interesting. Very, lots of new things. We, we have to think outside the box. So there are new new things that you present to us. So after your presentation, I, I'm pretty sure that everybody will start to, to think about new things. And uh, you are going to receive a lot of calls from Brazil and from other parts of the world to, 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 to get more information about your, your, your work. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I'm looking forward to come to visit Brazil again. Uh, yeah. I'm. I love Brazil, so I can't wait to come and have a beer with everybody when the pandemic is over, <laughs> which I hope comes sooner than later. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Stay safe.